Hello, everybody. We are going to get started on this panel about industrial policy, competition, and the single market. Uh, welcome to everybody. Please don't hesitate to come in and take a seat. Um, you might have to climb over other people. Um, especially warm, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the, our panelists, very distinguished people, and we are very appreciative that they were able to join. Um, what I'm going to do is take just a few minutes. Well, my name is Fiona Scott Morton. I'm a professor at Yale and also a fellow at Bruegel. And I thought I would take a few minutes to describe what's in the memos that we are going to comment on, because I'm sure some of you had not, have not yet had time to read them. And I will just be very short to give you an idea. So, um, as I said, the panel is about industrial policy competition in the single market, and this is a very hot topic, I think, in, uh, in Europe these days. And what the memos do is they try to impose some order, some intellectual structure on the swirl of ideas in this area. Uh, one topic uh, covered is that competition enforcement has gaps today, like tacit collusion and killer acquisitions where big firms buy very small ones. And we need to consider new tools um, for those problems. There's also a, a general topic about scale, that scale is needed for European firms to succeed. <clears throat> That's true uh, increasingly over time. And the broad solution to that is to deepen the single market so that a telecom company can serve Poland, the Czech Republic, Italy, and France all at the same time and have some economies of scale. Um, a third area is, of course, industrial policy. And there's old-style industrial policy, which is well-connected friends get a subsidy and uh, waste the money and uh, nothing useful happens. And a better one is when the state takes its funds to fix externalities that are stopping markets from working well. So, for example, there is some externality from climate or an externality from research and development or an externality that comes from the need to coordinate and the state can develop a program and put some subsidy there and make a market work better. Okay? So, pro-competitive industrial policy. And we have some ideas in the memos about uh, expanding the important projects of common European interest and uh, using um, tools like the Digital Markets Act to regulate uh, markets that are monopolies and, and really can't be um, made competitive. It's too late. So deepening the single market requires new rules. It requires tackling state interests that want to retain local control. Um, services are a particular focus. Incentives uh, will be needed. And there's a proposal in the memo for a 28th regime uh, to make uh, a single place where firms could satisfy all regulatory requirements for all of Europe instead of needing to do it member state by member state. Okay, so the theme of these uh, memos is really that pro-competitive industrial policy is a tool, and that tool can achieve the single market scale and competition all at once, so we really have some good solutions. Please, the people who are standing, come in, and there are seats down at the front and in the center, of course, and please just slide past uh, those who are seated and take those empty seats. Um, that will be more comfortable. So, with that introduction, I want to turn to our panelists for uh, some reactions. We are very fortunate to have a really excellent, not only uh, excellent quality panel, but well-dispersed panel. So, we have, uh, first to my right, Sven Giegold, who is State Secretary for Economic Affairs and Climate in Germany. And he has, therefore, the government perspective. Next to me on my right is Jan Mischke, who's a partner at McKinsey and therefore can see a lot of industries and a lot of firms um, and give the perspective of industry at that broad level. And then on my left is Luc Raymond, who is the CEO of Electricité de France. And that is going to give us a chance to delve into these issues from the perspective of a single firm. And then Reinhilde Vuglers, professor at KU Leuven, is all the way on the left, and she will help us understand the uh, impact of innovation on all of these issues and has the, just generally the academic and research perspective. So that will do, I think, very well to make a discussion, and we will go in that order. So um, I would like to ask Mr. Giegold if he could 
give some reaction to the memos and his thoughts on these issues. And it's about, we will take about five minutes uh, per person in this first round. Thank you. Yes, so first of all, it's great to be here and uh, great to be back to that church here uh, every year. And um, uh, so uh, first, it's, uh, I'm also delighted uh, that you are facilitating that panel. So our house and also the German government has done a lot to um, invite people from all over the world to work with us, uh, regardless from their national background. We need highly qualified um, uh, uh, new uh, people in our labor market, and you are particularly welcome, I have to say. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, not uh, has not been shared by everyone here in Brussels. Uh, is, uh, uh, but uh, when we come to competition policy, there's, of course, one big elephant in the room, everybody waiting for Mario, uh, and, uh, and uh, many tried to get hold of him, some managed, others didn't. Uh, so, and uh, there's the big uh, question, uh, do we need now a new approach to competition policy and uh, to the way how we protect our common market? And, um, and um, our belief generally is the common market rests on a fair competition. This will continue uh, to be so. And, uh, and this is uh, also needed for a fair balance between small and big member states, also for the consumer interest uh, and also uh, for a fair competition. And, uh, and therefore, um, everyone hoping that this will now all change uh, well, I think it's politically not doable. Second, it would also be economically wrong. Uh, so in most markets, we need tough competition rules, and this is also needed for global competitiveness. Uh, and therefore, um, we do not believe that in general, there has to be a profound change in the way how we, uh, we deal with um, our competition policy according to the treaties. Um, but, um, uh, and there is already today the possibility to allow for scale where needed. When it's possible to prove that in a certain market, and you named some sectors which I would share, where this is also in the interest of investment, uh, of global strength, then um, the Commission takes this already now into account. The only caveat I would make is that uh, these procedures in competition policies and mergers, but also in state aid, they take far too long. The problem is not that we have strict enforcement. The problem is if strictness in Europe takes longer than a new investment cycle in other parts of the world, then something is wrong. And that is, for this, DG Comp needs the respective resources. They have to prioritize these resources and make, um, make sure that uh, we get uh, the competition policy we all need. We also believe that we have some problems in some markets where, um, which are dominated by very large global firms which do not uh, have their origin in Europe. And in order to break up markets which are already too closed, we get, need to go beyond the DMA. For the digital markets, we have a very effective tool. It has to be implemented. But for other markets, we don't. And uh, therefore, we believe um, it needs an, an, an additional competition instrument, uh, in, uh, like we have introduced it now in Germany, which, like the UK, has already implemented it, and some other member states interested in, in order to break up markets in particular where we have the dominance of some global firms. And uh, lastly, I would like to make one remark concerning yesterday's uh, decision and, uh, at the court. And uh, the issue of killer acquisitions is a danger to innovation. And, uh, and therefore, we believe that now, um, of course, we could dream of uh, reforms of the merger regulation to to make a more targeted um, approach here. Merger regulation uh, uh, is difficult to change, as we all know, because it's unanimity, but there's a, a, a way out. Uh, member states uh, can now uh, lower, in very specific cases, the thresholds 
in order to control for killer acquisitions and then forward these cases to the Commission in full correspondence uh, with the judgment we have just received. So I believe uh, those member states which care about protecting our most innovative new firms uh, from killer acquisitions uh, should now take action. Uh, uh, we are looking into the subject now in Germany. Yeah, thank you. Very, also very, very interesting remarks here. And of course, competition is paramount. Uh, functioning of competitive markets is paramount also for competitiveness. But it's also important always to step back and say, what do we actually want to achieve with this competition and competitiveness? And at this point, probably at all points, but at this point particularly, what we really need to achieve is raising investment. Competitiveness and competition policy needs to be pro-investment policy. That's, that's the name of the game. Investment is responsible for 70 to 80 percent of productivity growth. And if I take Germany as one example, the gap that Germany had in productivity growth to the US over the last 30 years, mostly from weak investment, not only, but mostly from weak investment, adds up to what is currently the delta in income between Germany and Poland. So there's, there's, there's certainly something to do here. And to, to give the numbers, currently Europe invests per capita into machinery and equipment and intangibles half as much as the US. European large corporations invest 700 billion a year less than US corporations, 700 billion into capex and into R&D. And unless, unless we find a way to bridge some of that gap, neither growth nor competitiveness will follow we will just not build the future for our continent. And wh where are those gaps more pronounced? Where do we need those investments? It's, it's, it's across the board, but it's two areas that stand out. One is energy, and I will not comment much on it, <laughs> given whom we have on the panel here. The other area is, is, is technology, uh, broadly defined. And if we, if we look at that, just the Magnificent Seven in the US between them invest $400 billion per year about half of that in R&D, the other half in data centers and other capex, which is half of all European R&D spending. And in the up and coming area of generative AI, which will determine which region will literally be the most intelligent region, Europe invests one-tenth, as our upcoming research will show, uh, of the US. And no investment also means no market share, less than 5% in most parts of the value chain, and much of the talent leaving Europe. That's what we have to change. That's really what we have to change. And I think the tools to change that stretch, of course, way beyond single market policy and well beyond competition policy. But those two areas have to also add in to making that change. And as a, as a few examples or just kind of more, more questions to, uh, and, and, and thoughts to, to provoke, on the single market, surely single market and energy, I leave, I leave that separately. But on the technology front, it's really that scale is much more important than in traditional industries. Intangible scale at near zero marginal cost. So we need that single market for technology fast. We all know the single market will take further decades to complete. Uh, so as we have argued for a number of years now, we think a 28th regime is the only way out fast. And such a 28th regime would need to be brought. It would need to essentially cover all the headaches of businesses from VAT to labor rules to product market regulation, single window clearance of permitting procedures, and so on. But then it can be narrow in its applicability. Right? We could easily, for instance, say this only applies to scale-up firms. Everyone else, national rules, classical single markets, rules, whatever. So that's, that's just kind of one, one idea or question to raise. I think the second qu question is also on the scale in the sense of consolidation of markets, also in more traditional industries. Um, currently, investors are simple animals. They follow returns. Returns on invested capital in Europe are 4% lower than in the US. So as, as, as we kind of always rightly are concerned with prices, with margins, and so on, as we look at also consolidation and merger cases, maybe we should all ask ourselves the question, what is the right level of consolidation and the right level of margin to trigger investment? rather than just seeking the lowest one? The second question. 
And I think the third question, actually also to your excellent point, it's, it, it should really all be around addressing market failures, inefficiencies, externalities, and the like. The biggest uh, such inefficiency at this point in Europe is infancy. We just do not have the players nor the entire ecosystem to stand up to global players in technology. Uh, simply not. And it's, since, since they didn't occur so far, I think it would be relatively unwise to believe they will just pop up by themselves. So this is a point where heavy industrial policy could be justified, of course, in a very pro-competition way. And one idea to raise is to see, can we raise public innovation procurement to the tune literally of hundreds of billions of dollars per year? That's what it takes, hundreds of billions of dollars per year at the European level to trigger things like application of generative AI, say in healthcare, to trigger things like leapfrogging in semiconductors, to quantum computing, neuromorphic computing, or the like, and really set Europe up to be out there as a technology leader rather than to continue to fall behind. Thank you. Okay, super. I am just going to sum up a little bit so that we can, I will try to create a little connectivity between our speakers. And one thing I realized the audience might not appreciate is just recently, like yesterday, uh, the, the top court in Europe ruled that it is not possible that what the European Commission did to evaluate the Illumina Grail merger is not allowed uh, going forward. And the problem with the Illumina Grail merger was this was a merger of a firm that was um, not, not making revenue today, so its turnover was almost nothing, but its value was very high because it is researching cancer tests that it will put on the market in 2028 or 2029. So no revenue, but lots of value. And the merger regulation in Europe requires that a company have turnover to be caught at a threshold so that the European Commission can review. So the problem, as Mr. Giegold has said, is that then you are going to miss lots of important acquisitions that have a community dimension because they are big, important companies. They just don't have revenue yet. So there has to be a solution for that kind of thing. Um, so this, th and if you can do that, then you can preserve innovation and those fast-growing firms are the ones that need the investment. Uh, that that uh, uh, Jan was talking about. I will say I have one quibble with your description, which is uh, of the, we have to think about what the right level of consolidation is so that we get return, so that we get investment. That suggests that somebody can solve that problem, that there is a designer out there who says, oh, well, this industry's a little too fragmented. We're going to let them consolidate a little more. This one's a little too consolidated, we need to bump them up. And this is, first of all, there is no such place. And secondly, we don't know how to do it. And we just make mistakes. So it's, uh, I think, tricky to go in that direction. So now let's take, it, let's take the perspective of a firm actually in the trenches, so to speak, thinking about uh, its business in light of this policy uh, world that's operating uh, above. Thank you, Mr. Rommel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, I hope that we are out of the trenches, not in the trenches, uh, as uh, I consider business as an open field, uh, and it should be the case uh, more and more in the future. Uh, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm running today a, a mostly European company after spending years in a, in a global firm in the industry, uh, and clearly when I see the European market, uh, I see uh, first a, a strong opportunity to have the capacity to build long-term business in a world of rule of law, competences, and so on and so forth. So we should not start by harming ourselves and saying that life is terrible. No, we have fantastic assets, and that's the way an industrial company should continue to look at Europe first. Now, when we look at, at our history and whether we have been able to continue to develop our skills, develop our markets, uh, and our competitive landscape within Europe, yes, we have had ups and downs. Uh, and there are sectors that have been successful, sectors that have been uh, falling back. And sometimes the environment has helped or not helped. And that's what we need to question as citizens, of course. Um, and my first point there as a practitioner, as you said, is to say, we are a big, mar we are a big market. 
we are one of the biggest markets in the in the world. We are an educated, sophisticated market. So in the sectors where in history we have been strong enough to define what we want for our market, it used to be the case in telecoms in the 90s. We were global leaders. Why? Because we had defined objectives that are not just rules, objectives, strategic objectives for sectors, where based on this stable objectives defined for the market, the industry was able to invest, to decide, to localize, to do things that then would create a global leadership capacity. Then, unfortunately, it faded away. I don't want to come back on the conditions. I'm not an expert of the telecoms, but I think we have collective responsibilities on why uh, this capacity that was built at European level in the next decade started to be scattered. So uh, we have examples like this that are also successes, that remain successes. So my point is when we are able to gather as citizens in a given sector and to determine with the authorities what is the ultimate objective that we want to pursue for the benefit of our market, then we have a capacity to impose the rules, also with some impact on the rest of the globe. So you mentioned DMA recently. I think this is a major step forward, clearly, because DMA, for the first time, has led Europe to express its view as the largest market in digital, say how this should be structured in the future, as consumers ourselves. Based on that, of course, then industrial actors, whether they are located here or elsewhere, can make their choices and be steady in the future based on this strategy. So, And for me, of course, the rest of the competitive environment, competitive laws, plays a role to make sure that we stay in a level playing field that is well harmonized within Europe. But, you know, antitrust laws, they come very late in the cycle of forming decisions of companies. You know, you decide to go for a merger when you have no other option to grow basically. So it comes super late in the structuration of a business. So you don't develop a level playing field, an attractive uh, region, just by, having, just by having the best antitrust law or best antitrust execution. And I don't qualify the one we have today. I think this comes super late. State aids, I think we have been pretty good in harmonizing the state aids within Europe. Are we clear enough today on whether we are setting rules given the size of our market that are preventing other regions of the world to ruin our industries, in some cases, based on state aids. I'm not sure we are there yet. We still need to develop that. We, I, I could name a number of industries in the shipping industry, for example, in the uh, early uh, 2000, where the shipping industry has mostly disappeared based on a strategic view of another region of the world. Were we competitive at that time? Yes, we were. Uh, and the price dropped at that time, and then all of a the sudden they raised again. So all this needs some, I think, harmonized strategic view, sector by sector, which is shared between the industry and the regulators, and maybe where we need to do better, I think, have an approach of the markets that is not, let's regulate first. I think that's a big difference with other regions of the world. You know, take the US, they don't regulate first. They let the market develop, and then when the regulation is needed, they start to regulate. In Europe, we have a preference for regulation. And I think at some point, we need to give the opportunity to industries to develop faster, maybe to create some common goals that is shared with the public authorities, and then regulation matters, and if possible, as much as we can, of course, in a single market approach, because then this leads our market to be the bigger one, and the bigger market wins, of course, in terms of capacity to define the rules. And that's, that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to focus on industrial policy uh, here. Um, and particularly what's the new challenge of industrial policy. Even closer. Whoa. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'd like to focus on industrial policy and particularly the new challenges of industrial policy having to deal with the multitude of dimensions of targets uh, that it's facing here. It's no longer just about uh, stimulating economic growth, world competitiveness and jobs here, but also how to combine that with decarbonization and um, with resilience, sovereignty, security of supply here. And that's particularly a challenge if these dimensions are not align aligned, which they uh, very often uh, are here. 
And the way to, to address that uh, challenge uh, for me is actually by looking at the innovation angle. It's like what Jeremy said this morning here, industrial policy is basically about innovation uh, policy. This is partly because we still don't have all the technologies needed to deal with the ambitions that we have here. It, if we look at decarbonization, uh, only one quarter of the technologies are sufficiently mature. Uh, here, uh, all the rest still needs further developments. And then we're not even talking about the potential next breakthroughs that we would really need to in order to deal with, with these ambitions uh, here. Now, it's not only that we need these technologies in order to get to our targets here. It's also once we go for building innovation, capacity here that's also uh, a good source of, of building competitiveness here because that's on the basis of unique capacities that are not easy to imitate here and therefore can really constitute good sources of, of uh, competitiveness globally here and what also makes innovation very powerful is that it may also be better able to deal with the trade-offs of the different dimensions that I was suggesting here and changing these trade-offs uh, here. For instance, if we think of the potential of new technologies to come up with new materials for which we would be less dependent on others here, or where we would have more modular technologies where we can switch more easily uh, to produce here or to recycle uh, components here. So a lot of that strategic autonomy can then actually be realized uh, in much more effective ways uh, than, um, than so are sometimes proposed uh, here. So this innovation angle for me is really very important important as the new uh, trend that we need to hold for industrial policy. But of course, the innovation machine will not work in itself and it needs to be way more directed than before, if only because of the multidimensionality, because a lot of these other dimensions like decarbonization or strategic autonomy um, are also with, come with a lot of uh, extra externalities here for which the markets will not be able to, to solve this here. And that's why it also needs way more directedness uh, than what we've seen before here. And that's really the challenge for the new industrial policy here is how to cope with that directedness uh, here because we know that that also leads to way more scope for government failures here. Does the, does the government always have the capacity and the information to pick, uh, to make the right uh, choices uh, here? Um, and so that's finding that balance be between, on the one hand, what we used to have way more of a horizontal policy, we would also combine that with more vertical. That's a challenge. We don't know yet how to do that. We still have a lot to learn, um, but we have no time to wait, and we cannot wait here. So we should find a good way of, of still uh, engaging in the new industrial policy here by trying to minimize as much as possible that government failure here by having very flexible policy designs where information that comes available along the process Process is immediately taken into account to readjust uh, policies uh, here, allow for policy experimentation. And I think, and that's my final point, what I think is also very important is to have a good balance between still a very strong horizontal um, policies versus vertical here, combined selection with enough competition, competition ex ante for contracts, but also competition in the markets after uh, selection here, and combine also selection with still enough incentives for bottom-up here, so that we can we can afford uh, to select uh, here, even if we would uh, make mistakes uh, here. So that was my starting. That's a long wish list. Um, I want to go around again, um, focusing a little bit more perhaps on this innovation um, angle and thinking about in a world of scarce resources um, with the demographic transition, the green transition, the war in Ukraine, uh, there's just a lot of issues to fund in Europe, and it seems that if industrial policy is going to be one of those issues, that the way to get the most return for public money would be to try to spend industrial policy money in places where you get resilient, green, defense, innovation, and competition all at the same time. In some sense, draw a big Venn diagram and look at where the middle is. And I wonder if that kind of framing could be a productive way forward. And um, I know that Mr. Giegold has some thoughts about the climate part of this venture. Well, if you don't, you don't have to share them. But um, uh, yeah, it's a, sorry. Let me be more specific. If there are competing priorities for public money, 
how does industrial policy fit in there? I mean, my own view would be that what you said before, competition enforcement has to be part of it because that makes us efficient. And then we are preserving uh, as many resources as possible for, for people because they are buying at low price and high quality. Um, and we are not wasting public subsidies on industries that work fine. But if we are going to have some public subsidies, how to make them pro-competitive and achieve some of these other goals. And um, do you see any scope for designing industrial policy in a way that, that achieves these other goals? Well, uh, first, um, um, I, I would like to, to say that um, what we are doing now with the Commission cycles is setting priorities right. So we had uh, five years of um, of greening, and now we need five years to to implement this in a way that we also get a, a boost in industry and in competitiveness and in innovation. So uh, this is the priorities for the years to come, and the clean industrial deal provides the framework for this, and uh, and. Clean is to be understood under the four pillars of the Green Deal, so none of this is disappearing. And industry is not only traditional industry, but also uh, all sectors of the economy. So that's, I think, the framing which we have to choose. And then, uh, of course, your question was, how do we do this under the scarcity of public money? And, uh, and uh, first, I have to say, where the Green Deal is happening in, in Germany, we have a, a tremendous speed of greening of our en energy system, where the, um, where the private side is running the show. There is no scarcity of capital. So I've never seen any windmill, any uh, solar panel not being financed. So there is a lot of money around searching for good returns, and uh, none of this is failing uh, because of this. So, uh, of course, we have uh, problems, uh, as often has been discussed in Europe, on the capital market side. So, um, when it's coming to provide real risk capital, and, uh, and I would also say when it comes to innovative technologies, we have a huge problem because of our fragmented regulatory system. So, uh, first, uh, we have European rules, often as directives. Then we get uh, 27 ways to implement them. And once, and even if Europe has decided to do it with a regulation, then uh, um, unlucky innovators are faced with at least 27 regulatory supervisors uh, and uh, everything totally fragmented. So therefore, I share with you, uh, and we have d made the um, proposal together with our French colleagues uh, to come up with a European tech deal which needs to uh, the European space of the common market for one regulatory and supervisory framework for high technology. And, and I agree, the way forward to get there is the 28th regime. Uh, uh, but uh, the 28th regime alone doesn't help if there's still fragmented supervision. Because the rule uniform is worth nothing if everybody interprets them in a different way. And uh, therefore, at least for these targeted sectors, we need it. We saw it in the financial crisis. We moved to single supervision. We are, after many money laundering scandals, we have also done it in money laundering. But the lack of technological leadership in Europe in many key future sectors has not ring, uh, rung the same alarm bell. And it's time for this alarm bell in Europe. Uh, and uh, therefore, I agree on this. And finally, on the financing side, a typical Tinbergen model would say we need now one specific huge pot for future industrial policy, including defense and so on, only specified to that target. I believe this will not happen. We will not get this budget. So therefore, we have to think more creatively how to make use of existing pots of money in order to also grasp an additional effect, even if Tinbergen wouldn't love it. And, uh, and therefore, for instance, procurement reform, we will do that now in Germany to favor innovative procurement. Uh, this can be done, should be done now all over Europe. It's in the guidelines from von der Leyen. 
The same is with cohesion money. Cohesion money is a potential uh, for intelligent innovation in industrial policy if that sets the right framework. And lastly, for the public policy side, certainly at least on the European level, we have to make progress uh, on additional genuine own resources. If we want to do all this with 1% of GDP, we will fail. That's simply not responsible. Mr. Rimmel, does any of that appeal to you? Sure, uh, absolutely. Um, Look, you know, viewed from a, from a company, we, we certainly need to uh, uh, to, uh, to to continue to look at uh, innovation, R and D, development of technology, and their deployment in the region as the best ways to uh, continue to entertain the competitiveness of Europe. Uh, if you allow me, I will speak about my sector because this is the only one I, I, I'm trying to be qualified into. Um, if you look at the big effort that we have made over the last uh, two decades in Europe. We made a huge effort on the energy production side to make sure that we supply a clean energy, which is made of renewables in electricity and nuclear in, uh, uh, in uh, not all countries, but in some countries, just to make sure that we can supply 24-7 electricity without carbon. It allows my country, for example, to have 97% of its electricity uh, without carbon emission and to export uh, more than 15% of that to our neighboring countries. Um, this has deserved a lot of investment, including public support, not necessarily subsidies, but support, essentially to provide a long-term framework, because this is what the investors need, to be sure that they can invest in something that is going to be stable over time. So this is how renewables have developed over the last two decades in Europe successfully. And of course, we are going to continue. But if you look at what is the main challenge that we have ahead now, and I like the cycles that you described because I think this is exactly where we stand now. Uh, I think we have probably overcome a number of the challenges that we had on the supply side. Now the main challenge we have is to make of these capacities a positive competitive decarbonation opportunity for our industry. And of course here there is a hurdle because for an industry to repower, to change the source of energy, to change their processes, to reinstate the way they handle energy is a cost, is an investment. So this is where today, in my view, the biggest effort needs to be focused to make sure that we take this opportunity of bringing into the industry the competitive decarbonation effort with a public support. So that's why we have mentioned the idea of having an electrification bank, for example, it could be bringing these kind of uh, capacities uh, and instruments to the industry. Because when you look at the differences between the big regions in Europe, well, basically the main difference we have with the US and China is that we are not sourcing our energy ourselves except the one we generate. And that's essentially electricity. All the rest, we are competing with US who are essentially self-sourcing their gas for most of their energy and with China, who despite a huge and admirable effort of decarbonation of their electricity, still relies primarily on self-source uh, coal. That's an interesting difference between our region and our business partners, who are also our competitors. So if we want to make a leapfrog uh, uh, wish and action in Europe, we need to shift by taking decarbonation, not just as a common wish because we want to be good global citizens, but also a competitive effort. And by, because by relying on our own energy generation, renewables, nuclear, e-fuels, uh, renewable fuels, all this will contribute over time to our competitiveness, provided that we work now on the user side, that we accompany the users to make the choice of shifting to this new world where will they suppress their dependency on the imported carbonized sources. And that will help also our other markets, US and China primarily, to see the direction that Europe is taking. And again, by setting this direction, I think we will be in a much better position in the long term. So that's where we see the urgency for action at this stage. Of course, in the meantime, we will continue to work on the supply side to make sure that as the needle starts to move at a higher pace at European level on the needs of 
decarbonated electricity and decarbonated fuels, the industry continues to grow so that it can supply this amount. But for me, this is on the demand side that we need now to work very efficiently. And this is where there is space for a lot of innovation, which happens on the processes of industry themselves to uh, take the hand of every industry and to work with them uh, on the technology that enables the transition and also on the uh, supporting tools that we need to work together with the public authorities. Um, Jan, I, I am hearing the need for investment of, of several kinds. I mean, there's the frontier AI that you mentioned, and then there's electrification of a process that we already know how to do, but and, and electricity is not new, and yet the investment need there is high. Do you, wh what is your sense of the mix of types of investment that are needed? You talked about big numbers, but is there one place where that's more problematic than another, and, and how should we think about that in the context of an industrial policy? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be tempted to say this is now an area where we might just not know <laughs> and should let the competitive spirits go. Uh, but of course, that's that's partially wrong. Huh? To an extent, at a high level, we do know. We do know that we need a massive step up in our energy infrastructure. We do know that we need a massive step up in AI, unless we want to be the least intelligent region going forward. So I, I think there's just no discussion or debate around the need here. Uh, I think that it also, unfortunately, needs uh, means that we need to do a lot of things at the same time, rather than doing doing that prioritization. And while the discussion then often is like, can we afford that, and how do we allocate scarce resources, I, I would actually want to challenge that notion and, 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 in fact, even turn it on its head. Can we afford not to? Can we afford not to? I'm very nervous now because, yes, we have the IMF in the room, but I would argue, I mean, even the public debt sustainability in Europe, how much is it by excessive investment versus slow nominal growth? Just to give you the numbers in terms of investment, European public budgets are somewhere order of magnitude 50% of GDP total. Out of that, less than 1% is net investment, yeah? and less than 3% or 3 percentage points is gross investment, including the depreciation and letting our bridges rot and infrastructure decay. Yeah? Even, even if we reallocate just 5% of spending or find 1% annual efficiency in spending, huh? that would be a really low target in industry. After five years, we would have five percentage points more. Yeah, we could five-fold increase our net public investment just with 1% uh, annual efficiency per year. So I, I, I would really challenge a little bit the notion that this is scarce. I think we can do it. And, 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 I, and I have to kind of at that uh, little hobby horse of mine that also in terms, I see, see questions here also in terms of the fiscal rules. Uh, there's probably other people who can, can, can explain me why, why in the world we're also not in public accounting activating investments on a balance sheet rather than letting them hit our deficits right away and hit the Maastricht criteria. As someone from industry, I struggle to understand that. Yeah, I fully agree we have to do it, but the question, of course, is would we know how best to do it in the most efficient way here? Um, and I think what's really very important is uh, the the tools that are available at the EU level here, and I think there are two very important ones. One is an open single uh, competitive market here, and that also sets the agenda for the EU as being the most important uh, agenda tool, uh, and that's creating that open competitive single market here, because that provides really the strongest incentives for the private sector to innovate and to de-block their access to finance and skills here. So that's a single market for goods, services, single market for energy, for capital, for venture capital here but that also requires competition policy as, as um, unconstrained as possible here but nevertheless I think a competition policy that takes a much more dynamic uh, perspective here accommodating innovation rather than uh, trying to to block it because of they don't want to take the risk uh, here and of course also t an, a competition policy that takes into account the multidimensionality, so not only looking at short-term benefits for consumers in terms of prices here, but the longer-term 
broader uh, benefits to, to, to consumers uh, here. And that's a necessary condition for any kind of, of uh, industrial policy that would take place here, creating that open single uh, competitive market here. But on top of that, we would need also some kind of funding at the EU level that can complement what's going on at the member states here. And in the memos that we did on this, uh, the internal market memo and, and the one on innovation, we have a lot of suggestions here in how, what kind of things could actually be best done at the EU level or where the EU could actually help to top up uh, what's going on in member states here to fully leverage that uh, EU scale uh, here, like the IPCES, like the missions, the ARPAs uh, here. Does anybody ha want to react to anybody else that, uh, that I failed to invite? I was tempted by your remark on uh, public accounting because this is also a hobby horse of mine. And uh, when I, um, uh, we had, uh, we had long discussions about the, the Brussels language uh, is EPSAS, so um, the European Rules for Public Accounting. Uh, and uh, when, when we entered uh, government, I dare to suggest that perhaps Germany should modernize the way of its public accounting and move away from the way how a local charity runs bookkeeping and uh, to calculating investment and capital and uh, capital formation or um, loss of capital. Well, the reaction was not overly friendly across everybody. Uh, the only rational argument I heard against it is it creates too many jobs with the big four accounting firms and, and people like you. So to advise, uh, uh, to advise public, so, uh, public offices to deal with modern accounting. However, take it seriously. Take it seriously, it's, it, you are right. Because um, in democracy anyway, there is always a temptation of short-termism. And... Um, and Calculating properly that you overspend uh, in areas of short-term benefit and underspend in areas of long-term benefit would be so valuable in order to give voters a hint who is more in favor of the long-term and who is only making short-term promises. And for this, we need to calculate what uh, our capital stock is. And, and therefore, I agree with you, and um, when we want to have more of that, we need uh, to reform our EPSAS rules. I would be in favor. It's not the position of the German government, I have to say. Uh, but uh, I, I fully agree on the substance. And, uh, and uh, the funny thing in Germany is the lender and the local authorities, they are now obliged to do this, but the federal level doesn't, which I also find quite funny. But, uh, so, um, uh, but we, ha we don't have these rules. But favoring long-term investment for the public side is crucial. I see also there one other um, opportunity we will have with the new cohesion period, a possibility to learn a bit from the RRF experience. So this means if member states get access to the tempting pot of cohesion money in Europe, they should ex ante make some reforms in the area of economic uh, policy, innovation, and the like, without risking the strength of cohesion, which means local decision-making, the partnership principle. So we do not need to centralize cohesion, but we need to use the cohesion pot in order to get faster economic reforms of the different member states. And uh, I think that could be an, an intelligent compromise in the cohesion debate, which has been started by the speech of von der Leyen um, before her the vote in the European Parliament. So, and if I, if I can add to this long term, the need for long term uh, commitment, I think I would also like to add much more uh, attitude towards taking risks in public financing too, particularly for the early stage, high gain, high risk type of projects. Uh, here we should be also on the public side be willing to take more risks here in order not to avoid these big breakthroughs that could come out of this high gain, high risk. Yeah, that becomes difficult because then of course when the government has invested in a firm and it fails, the taxpayers wonder why that happened. 
I think uh, sometimes it is a little easier to put money into some kind of pot that has perhaps public and private money together, or is at least a portfolio. Yes. And yeah. then the government can point to the portfolio and its success, which... Yeah. Uh, so think more like a venture capitalist and think of tricky. portfolios and staging of your investments. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to ask the panel one of the questions that has come up on Slido, which is, how could we measure if there was an increase in EU competitiveness in future years, how would we know? What would be the measurement? What would each of you think of as a success on that dimension? And maybe, yes, go ahead. For our indirect investment, that's, I think, the, some of my colleagues have said that, but the first proof in the pudding is for in, for indirect investment. When you have people deciding to put capital at work in the EU, means that they find that this is a territory that is the most attractive. Of course, this is if this is just to serve the EU market, it's not the most convincing cases. The most convincing cases are FDIs on businesses that are serving global. When we have that, means we are competitive. And we, of course, we in our businesses, we are all following cases like this. There are cases where we win, cases where we don't win. When we don't win, we need to go to the root cause on what is the less competitive aspect that has been harming the chances of EU to win, and that's what we need to work on. Might be, uh, you know, complexity. Complexity is a very big hurdle. Complexity of our rules. Some of my colleagues have mentioned the 27 uh, interpretations. On, that's a very big hurdle. Sometimes comes much before the others that are on the headlines. This one is a very big hurdle. But might be others. But then we need to tackle them one by one, and that's how we make our territory more attractive. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think most of the competitiveness rankings have their 100 to 200 indicators. That's all nice, but in the end, investment is the pulse of competitiveness. If it happens, we are building the competitiveness, and it's also a sign that we are competitive enough that domestic and foreign firms invest. I would actually add the domestic investment in here, and then you can always be more sophisticated that you want certain areas and types, but why? Yeah, <laughs> Just one number. So let me notice that two of the panelists so far uh, have answered this question, and neither one has said we need to have the largest firm in industry X domiciled in Europe. And I think that is very, it's very sophisticated not to have that as your answer, because that is actually not really what we're after. We're after this growth and productivity element. Mr. Giegold. No, it's, um, you, you pointed uh, directly to, to our problem, so the weak growth in productivity in Germany, which uh, is even weaker than we have it in other member states, we, you, and also um, to the investment rate, which has not grown despite of the Green Deal efforts. So we see a lot of investment uh, triggered uh, by the greening policies, but in other fields we have weaknesses. So uh, the obvious response is, um, that um, we will now implement, and we are implementing now, 120 measures to, um, uh, to increase productivity growth. And 90% of these measures are supply-side. So a supply-side policy which favors also the transition in digital and greening. And uh, this is needed because we cannot be happy to have potential growth at 0.5% uh, uh, of GDP. This can, is not sustainable. Uh, so uh, I agree. And uh, this push for an intelligent supply side policy is needed. And we are doing it. And uh, that's not the end of it and it cannot be the end of it. So uh, we have well understood uh, the message. Uh, yeah. So, indeed, we are not looking for per se for size, but scale will matter here, because there are increasingly way more important economies of scale on various dimensions of operations here. So, firms should be able to deploy the scale that is really needed for uh, competitive positions uh, here. And unblocking that road to, to scale is very important. But that road should always be sufficiently contestable, so that there are new players with new technology solutions that can come up with even better solutions for scale, that's very important here. So incumbency should always be challenged 
uh, enough uh, and and t and remain technology open for new players here. So scale will be very important, uh, and that's also why we need at least a single market as your home base for scale here, but a contestable one. Uh. It seems, and German said this this morning, that everybody has known that the single market needs to be deepened for decades and decades, and that it's very important, and yet it doesn't happen. And it seems urgent, and yet it's not happening. So what is the secret here? Why, why, why is this so, so difficult? Or rather, if it's a certain level of difficulty and the value of it has gotten more and more valuable because of the nature of business and digital and so on to have scale. What is the, what is the hurdle? What is standing in the way of making progress? Well, I, I, I would say the main obstacle is uh, that um, talking about the need of uh, further harmonizing and have one big market is easy. But at least pointing to German history, it was a thousand years of fights between the common um, national level, uh, which was in the beginning, of course, not even existing, and the feudal rulers. In Europe, uh, we have been talking about this uh, for a very long time, but member states are resisting. So let's talk Capital Markets Union. I know in this church you have been talking a lot about this. Uh, the Commission has suggested, has made a good suggestion on insolvency law, which is one of the key issues. Not the only one, but one of the key issues. Uh, what is happening? The finance community is in favor. If you lie, ask 27 ministers of justice, they are all against it. So this is the old tension between rational economic and political need on the European level and uh, the resistance of local rule uh, not to change too much. This only could be overcome under intense um, uh, need and uh, shock. And uh, what I said before was exactly targeted to your question to say the moment is now. If we look to China, the US, what's happening in some of the BRICS countries, if Europe doesn't respond now by using the innovation strength of the common market, we missed this moment in history. Uh, and I think uh, we have to overcome these uh, short-termisms of local feudal rulers. Yeah. And Luke, would you say it's the local feudal rulers or the companies? Do companies want the, these open borders or do you feel protected by your local feudal ruler? No, I, frankly, I, I think most of the companies want a bigger market. Uh, this is common sense from an industry standpoint. The bigger the market, the easier life is. So I think most of the companies would uh, appeal for a bigger market. Um, now, it's not just the rulers. And it's a bit easy to say that this is just the rulers. I mean, this is more how to create a common vision. That's what I was mentioning at the beginning. It's how to create a common vision on a given sector. Probably uh, advising the rulers not to do too much regulation on technology. I think you should leave to the industry what belongs to the industry. Uh, you know, when the rulers start to say you should have X, Y, Z of this technology versus another one, you can imagine I could be more specific with an example, but that's that's not the purpose today. I prefer when the rulers are making something that is clear in what is the common goal that we want to achieve together. In my space, the common goal we want to achieve together is let's decarbonize our economy in the most competitive manner. And on this, with good rules and a single market, we should be able to do super well. Uh, and then it's for the companies and sometimes the nations as well to choose whether they have a preference for this solution or that solution. But mostly the companies. I mean, this uh, the question on whether you bet on a technology or on another that's an industrial, that's a company risk, essentially. So uh, so for me, these are the right steps to do. When we are in this direction, I think we are moving fast. It's not always the case. This is a wonderful way to close with these very positive ideas about how to handle this difficult problem. So please join me in thanking this really excellent and thoughtful panel, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.